Your faith is worth fighting for. And, and my prayer for you is that you would be uncomfortable. Uncomfortable breeds growth. Very little growth in life change happens when everything's fine. I'm not praying for something difficult to happen in your life. I'm praying that you might take steps of courage that would push you and stretch you. One of the ways that you and I can contend for our faith is to take steps of courage. Following Jesus requires movement. Jesus is never standing still. And we literally say we are following Jesus. That's a verb. That's action. So how are you following Jesus? When was the last time you took a step? When was the last time you were scared out of your minds following Jesus? Because you don't know how it's going to end. That's what faith is. It's taking a step, not knowing the end result. We are in a study on the book of Jude. And so if you have a Bible, you can turn to Jude. Uh, it's just one chapter. Uh, if you go to the very last book of the Bible is Revelation. You can turn a few pages and you'll find the book of Jude. We kicked off this series last week. And so if you missed, you can go online and check that out. It's just 25 verses. It's just 613 words. But I believe it's a really powerful message for all of us. If you get the email from the church during the midweek, it's called This Week at Boulder Mountain. There was a little write-up on how long it takes to read the book of Jude, just four minutes on average. So you can do it in a, a single sitting. But reading your Bible is really important. Knowing God's word, knowing the truth of God's word is a really important value here at Boulder Mountain. As we look at verses three and four of Jude today, I ask, I ask the question this morning, how can someone walk away from their faith? Maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you walked away from your faith for a period of time. Maybe you have a friend or a family member right now, they've, they've abandoned their faith. They've walked away from their faith. They've, they've left the church, if you will. I, I remember my roommate, I spent four years with him uh, in Bible school. We were preparing for ministry, and after we graduated, he eventually walked away from his faith. I've had friends. I was a youth pastor for many years, and students who grew up in the church, and they Tell me later, have, I'm, I'm done with, I've walked away from the church. How does that happen? Maybe you have experiences or there's people in your life who have walked away. A couple of things just to point out. Last week, we were reminded that Jesus does not forget you. You cannot lose your salvation. The Bible teaches that, that you are kept and sanctified in Jesus. Let no man pluck them out of my Father's hand, Jesus says. And so we ask ourselves the question, a few things that come to my mind, why somebody would leave the church, just a few things, there's probably other reasons. Number one is there's a tragedy in their life. A great tragedy happened to them and they blame God. And they can't understand why this would happen as a follower of Jesus. Just this morning, I received a text from a a student I had through junior high and high school, and she said, I have ovarian cancer. I don't think she's quite 30 yet, and she doesn't have children. She, I did her wedding a year and a half ago, and they had to remove her ovaries, so there's no chance of children in the future. It's stage four. The outlook looks bleak. And so she's telling me this, but she says, but God is good. I don't know what tomorrow brings for you. I don't know what awaits you the rest of today or tomorrow. But one reason people abandon, walk away from their faith can be tragedy. Another reason can be, well, I've been hurt. I was hurt by somebody within the church. And because of that, I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. I'm not going to attend that church anymore. Has anybody been hurt by the church? I'll start, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. Jesus did not hurt you. Broken people, broken individuals in the church hurt you, and I'm so sorry for that. That may happen again in the future. Why? Because there are people within the church, and anytime there's people, there's problems. 
my friends, Jesus has not hurt you. And so hurt can be a reason people walk away from the faith. Comfort can be a reason people walk away from their faith. It's really, really comfortable. My job as your pastor is to make you uncomfortable. (laughs) Another reason can be a stagnant faith. Sometimes I'll sit down with somebody and I'll say, tell me what God is doing in your life. And they'll tell me, hey, 40 years ago, I was invited to church and I gave my life to Jesus. I'm like, well, that's great. Praise God. But what's God doing in your life right now? Well, 40 years ago, I was invited to church and I gave my life to Jesus. No, what's God doing today? Let me ask you, what's the movement in your life? What are the things that you're doing? What steps are you taking of faith? And sometimes we become so comfortable and so stagnant and we realize, hey, I'm, I'm doing okay without this church thing. Maybe we believe that God owed us something and when that didn't happen, we became frustrated. Jude is writing to a group of people. Uh, verse three, he writes, beloved, right? We looked at that last week. The greeting was last week. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about your common salvation, I was going to write to you about something, but the Holy Spirit came upon him to change what he was going to write about. And so every word of God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? There's nothing in this book that was not written, breathed, as we would believe, uh, from God. And so every word that Jude writes, all 613 words were given to him by God. He had something else to write, but the Holy Spirit said, don't, don't write about that. I want you to write about this. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, if somebody were to ask you what's the theme of Jude, it's right there in that verse, to contend for the faith. It's a common theme of the book. It's, it's the big idea of the book. It's his, his uh, uh, hypothesis of the book that we are to fight for the faith to contend, to appeal, to insist, to stand firm for the faith. And he writes appealing. It's a really strong word. To contend for the faith that once for all delivered to the saints. So he's talking about a work that was done once for all. It was a permanent work. To who? To the saints. Who are the saints? You are the saints. You are a royal priesthood. You are redeemed, you are set apart, you are holy, and my friends, you are saints. That's what you are. And Jude says, that work was done, it was complete, it's once once for all. And now we're to contend for that faith. The most important thing in your life is your faith. And it's not even close. Your faith is the most important thing that you have. It's the work that Jesus did for you, you personally on the cross, that he loves you unconditionally. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing that you believe. And Jude says, I need to write to you about this. Now, just as I was writing through this, reading through this, studying this, I thought there's a number of times where I'm overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit to text somebody. And maybe throughout your week, God brings people to your mind, a, a relationship, a friendship, and you're to reach out to them. Let me encourage you to do that. And you're like, I don't know why I'm texting you, but I just, God placed you in my heart, so I'm going to text you. I'm going to email you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, phones actually, you can call and talk to somebody. It's an amazing thing. You can dial a phone number and talk to them. And so if God ever says, hey, call that person, you don't know why, do it. That's what Jude is saying. Hey, I've been led to write to you. Now, they didn't have planes back then to hop on a plane to go see them. But maybe he would have if had they have. This is really important. Uh, the third, third John, John writes, hey, there's a lot of things I want to write to you, but I, I'd much rather do it in person. So I'm going to come see you. I remember when uh, years after I was a youth pastor, a uh, mom of a student at another church called me up and said, my son's going through a really difficult time. He's going through some stuff. He's in crisis. 
And I just felt led in that moment to fly back to Wisconsin to see him, to sit face to face and talk to him. It was that important. So I talked to my wife and she's like, yeah, you, you go, you do what you need to do to go, go see Brian. So I sat with Brian for a couple days. Let me, let me tell you, there's times we're going to be overwhelmed. We don't know what to say. You don't, you don't know what to do. You're, you're in over your head. That's a good place to be. But here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Show up. My friends, you get points for showing up in somebody's life. They won't remember what you say. They'll remember that you showed up. They'll remember that you were there with them. And Jude says, hey, I'm, I'm going to show up in your life because there's something really important I need to talk to you about. What is that? Verse four, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, some heavy stuff here. He's going to talk about godliness and ungodliness through the rest of the book. I think six times in 25 verses, he's going to talk about godliness and ungodliness. He's talking about, remember this is a general epistle. It's a general letter written to the church in general, not a specific location, not a specific group of people. It's, it's written to us. And so he's saying to the church, Beware of people who creep in. They seem really nice. Wow, they're amazing. They're so generous. They're so kind and nice. And then little by little, they begin to teach things that are not of God's word. So he says, beware, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. Long ago were designated for this condemnation. Now, what's he talking about there? God can use even evil people to accomplish his, his glory. Romans 9 talks about Pharaoh. Pharaoh was an evil man. We're told that Pharaoh was an evil man, but God used Pharaoh to accomplish his purposes with the nation of Israel. So Jude is saying, warning, church, be careful. Be careful who you let into leadership. That's why sometimes we would much rather acknowledge leadership than appoint leadership. That's why the work of our elders and our deacons is, is so important to guard the gate a little bit. It looks like this in the book of Nehemiah when they build the wall. Nehemiah comes in and they have to build a wall to keep the enemies out. And so as they're building the wall, they have a trowel in one hand. They're actually putting, doing the masonry work of the wall. And they have a sword in the other hand because they have to build the wall, but they don't know at any time the enemy could attack. David writes that when, when a shepherd is caring for the sheep, what are the two things that a shepherd has? You know the passage, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, right? The, the staff is to guide the sheep. That's what Jesus is doing with the church. He's, he's, he's bringing comfort to the church. He's, he's guiding the church. But he, the shepherd also has a club, the club isn't for the sheep. The club is for the enemies who are trying to attack the sheep. Does this make sense? Don't club the sheep. Club the wolves that are trying to attack. And Jesus says, hey, the wolves are coming. There's going to be a day the wolves are going to show up within the church. And then Paul shows up and he, he writes about, hey, there's wolves coming. And Peter writes about, there's wolves coming. And what does Jude write about? The wolves are here. There's wolves, and they, they seek a false gospel. It's, it's a wrong gospel. It's, it's different from what the Bible teaches. Now, if you and I wanted to study and identify a counterfeit bill, do you know what we study? Not the counterfeit. We study the real thing. The more we know the real thing, the more we'll be able to identify a counterfeit. And so there's, there's false teaching, there's false gospel, and the primarily the one that Jude is addressing is the, is the extreme permissiveness within the church to take grace, which is a gift, and to receive it without repentance. It's to take grace as a license to go and do anything and live your life in any way, because you know you can go for an hour a week on Sunday and God will forgive you. And that became a moral license, Jude is, is addressing, hey, you're cheapening grace when you do that. 
In 1961, the great Vince Lombardi of the greatest football team to ever play is the Green Bay Packers, amen? No? Am I in foreign territory here? He walked into the locker room for the first day of practice. The year before, they lost in the NFL championship game, which is now known as the Super Bowl. But he walks in. He's got 38 of the best football players in the world. And he stands up in front of them, and he, he says, Gentlemen... This is a football because he knew in order to be the best football team in the world, they had to get back to the fundamentals. And so he starts in front of that locker room. In 1961, that season, he says, gentlemen, this is a football. Now they had showed up expecting they're going to they're going to dive deep into new blocking schemes and new play calls and new routes. And he starts by saying, this is a football. And we're going to focus on the fundamentals. We're going to focus on how to tackle, how to block, how to throw, and how to catch. And he says, turn to page one of your playbook. And from that point on, they won the next five Super Bowls, five of the next seven years. They didn't lose another playoff game. He became one of the, the greatest to ever coach. And now the standard for coaching and for football is the Green Bay Packers. They have the Lombardi Trophy. And for the Cardinal fans, I want to show you the Super Bowl symbol. This is what a Super Bowl football looks like, because I don't know if you've ever seen one. But I, I happened to do a wedding for a family member of a Packer player a couple of years ago. And when I do weddings, I don't charge for those weddings. But hopefully, you know, you hope you get a little honorarium or a little gift or something. And so I was hanging around this wedding. I spent uh, a lot of money on this wedding. So you're like, hey, pastor, you maybe get a little something. So afterwards, they came up to me. I'm like, here it is. I'm going to get something. They give me a football. And so it says uh, to Pastor Kyle, and it's signed by the, the player, go pack. But just a little, little side story there. But the basics, Christian, don't ever forget the basics of what does it mean that God saw you in your sin. The greatest, most important sentence in all the Bible. I believe they're all really important. But one of the most important, theologian Leon Morris says the greatest sentence in all the Bible is Romans 3, 23 through 26. That's a long run-on sentence in English, but in Greek it's one sentence. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel reminds us that we were sinners who couldn't save ourselves. Don't ever forget that. You didn't do anything to earn your salvation. The fundamentals. There was a church in Northampton, Massachusetts. It was pastored by a Jonathan Edwards. Maybe you're familiar with that name. Around the 1750s to 1770s. He began through one sermon that was not done, delivered very well. He read it from a manuscript. He stood in front, very monotone voice, read the sermon. It was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And as he read that sermon, it wasn't even the first time he preached that sermon. He had preached it before, but he read the sermon and everyone in the room gave their life to Christ. And it began a revival. And that revival was the first great awakening of the United States. And that church in Northampton, Massachusetts was known as preaching the gospel. That church still exists 200 years later. But Jonathan Edwards would roll over in his grave if he read their statement of faith on their website of the church. The Edwards Congregational Church, it's a very permissive gospel. You can live your life any way you want. There's no mention of sin. False teachings creeps in among us. It can look a lot of different ways. It could be a Jehovah's Witness, which teaches us Jesus was created. It could be Mormons that believe Jesus became a God. He hasn't always been God, but he became a God. It could be the prosperity gospel that says Jesus is a means to an end. He's a divine butler ready to give you whatever you wish for. You just have to have faith. Or in this case, a progressive gospel, which believes that Jesus is a good man. He has some good teachings, but you can live your life any way you want with no consequences. There is no mention of sin. It is only about love. And Jude says, warning, be careful who you allow in, who you allow in leadership, because they are perverting the grace of our God into sensuality. Sensuality is not just sexual. It could be anything that's pleasurable, anything that, 
that feels good and deny our only master and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Your faith is worth fighting for. Your faith is worth fighting for. So he talks about the faith. So what does that look like in your life? Be reminded of the day you heard the good news and you responded. Be reminded of that. Be reminded of the grace that God gave to you every day of what, what that looks like. There are those who are in, within the church, Jude writes, who are cheapening grace. How, how do you do that? It's, it's grace without re, repentance. Forgiveness without repentance. You, you can't have the good until you, you have the bad. You don't, the gospel is really, 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 really good, but it's only really, 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 really good and amazing when you realize how bad the bad is. You and I are separated from God for eternity until we recognize the sin in our life and we place and trust Jesus with our phone. With, we trust him and him alone as our savior. Gentlemen, this is a football. It is the gospel that we need to be reminded of. That you never, ever forget where you've been and what God has done in your life. What does it mean to cheapen grace? What does it mean to justify all the, the way that you live your life? Jude is addressing that. Let me give you an illustration. This, the last couple of months, we got a gym membership in our family. Now, some people work out in their garage. Some people take it out on the trails. Uh, some people, you know, manage it their own way, but we decide we're going to get a gym membership. And let's say me and a buddy go to the gym. We go to the gym at the same time. We drink the same water at the gym. We listen to the same music at the gym. We work on the same equipment. We're pumping the same weights and the same iron. We're there for the same amount of time. And then we leave the gym. And there are two very different perspectives when you leave the gym. One, I'll put me as that one. I leave the gym and I justify the rest of my week because I was at the gym for an hour. I eat whatever I want. I do whatever I want and I don't do whatever I want because I was at the gym for an hour this week. The other person takes the gym with them. And that gym and that mentality affects everywhere they go and every person they interact with and everything they're about to eat. Do you see the difference? The grace of God does not give you a license to live your life any way you want. It compels me to honor God with everything I have because of what he's done for me. He calls us saints. He calls us, he, he says we're called, we're loved, we're kept, we're saints once and for all. And let me remind you of the gospel. Let me remind you of the good news that we're not to live life any way we want. And he talks about, make sure that there are, there are, Guidelines and there's gates and there's ways that we shepherd people. It matters who we put in front of people, who we le who's leading our students and who's leading our children and who's leading small groups. It matters because it's so easy to, to begin to teach some things that, that aren't of Scripture. Church, know your Bible. I mentioned this week in the article just some tips. If you don't have a current Bible reading plan, uh, there were some tips in there about have a good translation. Uh, have, a, have a plan when it comes to reading the Bible. Reading the Bible is always better in a group. So if you're not a part of a group, let me encourage you to, to get, in, get into a group. Let me read this passage in the paraphrase message translation. The message was written by Eugene Peterson, who's brilliant. It's not a translation, but it's paraphrase. Let me read this. Dear friends, I've dropped everything to write to you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting or begging that you fight with everything you have in you for in this faith entrusted to you as a gift to guard and cherish. What has happened is that some people have infiltrated our ranks. He's using battlefield language. Our scriptures warned us this would happen. Who beneath their pious skin and shameless, are shameless scoundrels. Their design is to replace the sheer grace of our God with sheer license, which means doing away with Jesus Christ, our one and only master. 
It's talking about defectors or nominal Christians. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but underneath are ravenous wolves. The enemy is trying to convince you that that pleasure, that thing you want to do, yes, so it'll feel good for a night, but it'll lead to death and destruction in the long, in the long term. First Timothy 4 says, some will depart from the faith. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now, this is some heavy stuff. And maybe personally you've experienced or relationships that you have. In the culture that we currently live in today, it is so easy to be stagnant and to be comfortable. Today, as I stand here, there are 365 million Christians at this very moment who are subject to high levels of persecution and discrimination. One in seven Christians are persecuted worldwide, including one in five in Africa and one in seven in Asia. Your faith is worth fighting for. And, and my prayer for you is that you would be uncomfortable. Uncomfortable breeds growth. Very little growth in life change happens when everything's fine. I'm not praying for something difficult to happen in your life. I'm praying that you might take steps of courage that would push you and stretch you. One of the ways that you and I can contend for our faith is to take steps of courage. Following Jesus requires movement. Jesus is never standing still. And we literally say we are following Jesus. That's a verb. That's action. So how are you following Jesus? When was the last time you took a step? When was the last time you were scared out of your minds following Jesus? Because you don't know how it's going to end. That's what faith is. It's taking a step, not knowing the end result. Following Jesus is not, oh, I have to have all the answers. I was talking to somebody. We, there's a group of people on a mission trip right now. Half the team has never been on a mission trip. I'm so proud of them. They're doing something they've never done before. We're talking about going places next year in 2025 that we've never been before as a church. And I was talking to somebody about that. Like, well, what about work? And how much is it going to cost? And I don't know if I can do this and get time off. Yeah, that's scary. There's a lot of unknowns. But we're to follow Jesus. One of the best ways to fight for your faith is to do some things that you've never done before. Contend for your faith. And as you do that, you will see God show up in, in powerful ways. Sometimes we walk away from things that have no meaningful value in our life because we're not putting it into practice. During COVID, that was a snapshot of a couple of years. People realized, hey, my life, I, church wasn't giving me any value. I wasn't experiencing anything there because I wasn't doing anything. It was a one hour a week, check the box. And when it went away, my life didn't change very much. So 20% of people during COVID, Christians, never came back. Do something. Boulder Mountain, my prayer is that you would not be a one-hour church. You wouldn't just come and sit in a row. That you would, you would go on retreats. You'd be part of small groups. You'd, you'd serve and you'd give and you'd, you'd experience the craziness of what God has for you. The second way to fight, or the third way, a third point, you're all confused now. If you're taking notes, number one, your faith is worth fighting for. Number two, Fight for your faith by taking a step of faith. And number th three, fight for your faith by helping someone else find their faith. We're told in the final words of Jesus before he leaves, go and make disciples. It wasn't an option. It wasn't a, when you feel like it. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? You make disciples. Uh, parents in the room, if you're not discipling your children, it begins there. Don't just give that over to the church to do. We will partner with you. We'll teach your kids scripture. Uh, our youth group will teach them God's word and come alongside, encourage, and support. But you are the primary spiritual disciple maker of your kids. It begins there. If your kids are grown and gone, there are other people in the church. I'll sit with people. I'll talk to them. I'll have coffee with them. Like, have you ever been discipled? They're like, no. How long have you been in the church? 50 years, 60 years. I've never been discipled. 
come along. What does it mean to disciple somebody? It means spend a lot of time with them, up close and personal, over many years. And it looks like this. Hey, I've been where you, you were. I've been there. I know what you're going through. By God's grace, here's some things he taught me. And I'm going to share with you. We all need people in our life who've been in places that we haven't been yet. And, and my friends, there are people in the church who would love for you to come alongside them to disciple them. There's formal discipleship. There's informal discipleship. It's a joy of mine to come alongside men and disciple them. Not because I'm a pastor. Now, you may be sitting there and saying, oh, that's your job. No, because I'm a follower of Jesus, I get to disciple other men. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's someone in your life that you should be pouring into. You should be making disciples. Uh, on this stage, I can't disciple anybody. I can teach some things. I can share some things. I can uh, tell you some things. But disciple making is what Jesus did with 12 men in a boat and on a mountain and along the beach having campfires together and in homes. That's disciple making. And I, I can't disciple that many people. But can I, is there one? Is there one person that God brings to my mind that I could spend some time with, a little extra time? And maybe you're in the room and you're new to Jesus. And you feel like, yeah, I, I would love to have that. Nicole talked about it in her testimony. Older women, it's not always about age, but many times it is. Older women coming alongside a younger mom and saying, hey, I've been there. And those days feel like they'll never end. I know my wife was blessed by an older woman who came over and just said, I've got the kids, you go get a cup of coffee. Made a huge difference. You can contend for your faith while you help somebody else find theirs. To put your arm on them and say, hey, let's go shoulder to shoulder on this. Somebody who's gone through a traumatic event, somebody who's been hurt by the church, say, hey, it's, don't give it up. It's, it's, it's too important to leave don't walk away. Who is it? Who's the one person that you could reach out to? And maybe you've tried and they've rejected you. Try somebody else. You look for the person of peace. Who's open? Who's willing to grab coffee once a week? Spend some time together. I, I love hiking. Uh, that's kind of my classroom when it comes to disciple making getting on the trail, getting to know people. Listen, there's times I need to lean on people. I'd be lying to you if I told you that I never thought about walking away from my faith. I'd be lying to you if there weren't days where I felt like this pastor thing's not working out. And I walk into a quick trip and on the sign, the front door of quick trip says they're hiring managers. And I think about it. Oh, wouldn't it be great? It's like a nine to five. I greet everybody, but I don't have to hear all their problems. I can go home. I'm, I'm bearing my heart here. But my faith is, is worth it too much. Contend for your faith. It means too much. Your faith is worth fighting for, my friends. If you're having a bad day or you're feeling like, hey, I, I'm going to walk away, give me a call. Let's go have coffee whether it's you reaching out to say, I need to be around some godly people. Join a group. Join a, join a men's group. Join a women's group. Join a small group. We have groups kicking off and starting all different times. Build some relationships. God never said, all you need is me. He never said that. He said, you need me and you need other people in your life. People who know everything about you. You can call up at any time. You can cry together. You can laugh together. You can have somebody say, hey, you're about to do something really stupid. Do you have a friend who can tell you you're about to do something really stupid? I have like five of them because I don't listen to just one. And have that conversation with them. Hey, I need you to, I need you. Please, if you, if you see me about to head in the wrong direction, Love me enough gently to restore me back. Jude, let's be careful in what's being taught. Let's know our Bibles. Let's continue to take steps to fight for our faith. Rejoin me in prayer. So Father God, I thank you 
Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the signs and the warnings and the caution. And, and maybe we've been in that season in the past. There's been times in our life where we drifted away. God, I pray that you would encourage us to take steps of great courage to do things we've never done before. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to us this morning. You would make it crystal clear what it is you're saying. And you would give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.